All right. Welcome to Zen Warrior Podcast. I have as my guest today a man who will need no introduction to musicians. Um, many people might hear the name Kenny Aronoff and not know who I'm talking about, but musicians will definitely know who I'm talking about. So here's a little secret for anyone, a little, a little clue for anyone who's wondering who this guy is. You'll know after I do this. Da, 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 da. <laughs> So he's been the man behind the drum kit for John Mellencamp, 17 years behind the drum kit for John Mellencamp, 20 years with John Fogarty. He has played on over 300 million albums sold. He is one of the most well-known drummers in the world. Rolling Stone has uh, ranked him one of the top drummers of all time. So I am pleased to have on the show today, Mr. Kenny Aronoff. Welcome, sir. All right, nice, nice to be here, buddy. That was yeah. great. <laughs> that right intro on, with uh, usually it's not the guitar, then they go boom, blam, boom, 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 ba doom, boom, ba doo, do 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 do. Anyway, that was great. Right, right. <laughs> Thank you, man. So, yeah, you're welcome, man. It's so great to have you. It's it's uh, such an honor. I would be starstruck if it wasn't for the fact that you're such a chill dude. So I <laughs> appreciate that about you. Thank you. So. Um, I want to just start right off. I mean, there's so many things that I, I missed in that intro. I want to give our listeners a chance to, to hear more from the horse's mouth about your career, people that you've worked with, uh, albums that you've been on, you know, et cetera. Yeah. Just, you know, let us have it. Well, um, <clears throat> the, well, like you said, uh, 300 million records sold, but the thing that it, that's unique about my career is that you're lucky if you make it in a band like I did with Mellencamp and did recording and toured for 17 years, selling out arenas, private jets, staying at Ritz Carlton. You know, it was a total. It was a, and it was a great time of our of our age because we were in our late twenties into our thirties. It was sex, drug, well, yeah, sex, drugs, rock and roll. We weren't Motley Crue, but we we were nice guys. But and believe it or not, John Mellencamp didn't drink, smoke, didn't do anything. He was really no kidding. No, he, he was, was just sober that whole time. Yeah, he was. He hate, the doctor told him he needed to chill out, and so he said, "You got to drink a little bit of wine." John would drink wine like this. <laughs> he, he, Get out of here. Yeah, he didn't do anything. But we were a nice band, but you know, we definitely were living the rock and roll dream. You know, we had a hospitality room and. We didn't, you know, if I, I mean, here's an example, one, one show, 20,000 seat arenas. We had no opening act. It was just us for three hours, like Springsteen. We do an hour and 15, take a 15 minute break, go out and do another show. And uh, 360 degrees, we'd sell out arenas all over the country. And uh, I remember one time I, I'm, I'm telling my tech and we had a huge stage and he'd come running. What's up boss? What's up? I said, you know, ain't that America for you? Hey, um, you see that trick in the third row with the, the stripe, you know, blue and white striped shirt? Uh, give her a backstage pass. Oh, okay. He goes running down there and, you know, everybody's standing and clapping and singing all the lyrics. And he goes, her. And I'm like, yeah, her. And he t gets her attention and he gives her a pass. And she looks at me and went, me and went, yeah. And I keep continue playing. And the end result was we'd go backstage. We were all, like I said, really nice guys. And we had a hospitality room with, we'd set up a room where you-, you A you hospitality room. <laughs> well, Quote, we, unquote, hospitality. Yeah, nothing, like I said, we weren't Motley Crue or Van Halen. Nothing happened there, but it was that place you could go, hey, um, hey, we're spending the night. You want to come back to the Ritz or wherever we were staying, have some drinks? Then the rest was whatever. But uh, got then they, you got to take them to hospitality room number two. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I see. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, but yeah, uh, yeah, that, that, didn't, that didn't answer your question, but the, it's, uh, it's part of the, the answer. And uh, so what, what I'm saying is I was living the dream. And uh, yeah, I'll tell yeah. you what happened before getting that. It was not easy to get there. Um, but the thing is, is that uh, after eight years, our, our schedule was – we we uh, John would write songs and we'd arrange them and record them and that would take a year. Uh, we would back then the budgets was so big because people were selling records 
I'm on three records that sold 40 million copies, two Celine Dion's and one Meatloaf Bad Out of Hell 2 and Ricky Martin 20 million and you know, it just goes on and on. And the point is, is that when the labels were making, they were making like 85 cents, 82 cents on the dollar and the rest went to the artist. That's a lot of money and they could then reinvest in new bands. They could invest and put you in the studio, uh, the expense of getting you on tour and on and on marketing, uh, you know, uh, publicists, all these things, which by the way, the artists had to pay back at their, at their rate of return, which is like, mm -hmm. they would have to pay back, let's say $2 million at their 15 cents on the dollar. Right. You're just getting totally hosed by the record company. Yeah. You, they, they made money. As a matter of fact, and I was going to mention this the other day, uh, the record labels are actually doing really good right now. Mm -hmm. The music business, as far as record sales, is absolutely horrific. The last way to really make money, unless you have a number one hit like, you know, Billie Eilish, her record did good. But, um, like, the only way you can make really money is touring. And that's why this pandemic mm -hmm. has really crushed uh, the musicians. It's like the, the last straw, you know. So selling records you could make money but what happens the labels own the masters of in other words if they give you you know let's say five hundred thousand dollars half a million dollars to make a record part of the contract is they most cases they own the masters the master mm -hmm. recording and mm -hmm. what that would mean is that that if a movie wants to use uh that song that is on the record then the label does the deal with the uh, movie company. Now, if you own your own masters, uh, the artists, then they can make the deal. As a matter of fact, the song, My Sharona, uh, The Knack, I redid a version, because I, I have a, a heavy classical training. I wrote every single note of that drum track, which actually is a very complicated drum track. It sounds easy, but it gets crazy at the end. I got the mic, mic the 12 mics to record that song i got each microphone sent to me so i could hear exactly what the drummer bruce gary was doing wrote out every single note it was three pages of insanity of just it looked like you know fly shit on a, on a piece of paper i'm no i'm like notoriously known as the most anal chart writer in the world every single tom tom every crash the idea was i mimicked that track they put the original track up in the right speaker, they put me on the left and I mimicked it note for note. Wow. They couldn't believe it. They were like, their mouths dropped. As a matter of fact, when I was doing it, I kept thinking they'd go measure by measure. And I was going through, you know, a third of the song before they stopped and went, how the fuck did you do that? But I write every note out. So the point is, is that That's now- that classical training, man. That, that has to be what that is, huh? Massive class. I'll, I'll talk about yeah. that in a minute. Yeah. But yeah. uh, the, um, the, the point is that the band then took the second best vocal, not the original vocal, because that was on the master. They got the second best vocal, which sounded like, like the first, really. You know, you, the singer might sing it 20 times and they comp it. And then there's one that's like almost as good as the one they pick. We use that. The bass player replaced his part. The guitar player replaced his part. Now they owned a version of My Sharona that sounded like the master. Now they could then sell it to a, let's say a movie for 150,000 where the label was like, wow, well, we're not gonna sell it unless we get 500,000 and then the band's not making any money. So mm -hmm. I was doing, that's what I would be hired to do. Uh, and or in some some artists, their, their, their masters come back to them after, well, I think it happens in publishing, comes back to you after 25 or 30 years, whatever it is. Bottom line is, I made it a, in a band. We do a, a year of record of, of getting ready to make, we make a record promotion and go on tour for a year, take a month off and start again. I did that for right. eight years nonstop. And then John Mellencamp quit suddenly. He said, I quit. I'm fucking taking three years off. He was exhausted. Back then I was devastated. I just gotten divorced. I, I, you know, I'm thinking like, okay, child support, mortgage, car payment, normal shit. And I'm thinking, Oh my God, I'm at the mercy of this guy what, when he decides to work or not. And I freaked out. And then immediately I turned into that fight or fight guy that I am. I went, wait a minute. Instead of working for one artist, I'm now going to work for all the other ones. And so mm. I was starting to get, starting to do sessions already. 
because I was with John all the time, I could only do so many. When that happened, I moved right, I, I, I flew to LA and, and I was doing a record and I started spending time in LA, staying at people's houses and trying to make it, basically in long and short of it, after a year of doing a little bit here, a little bit there, I hook up with this producer, Don was to do Iggy Pop. He goes to the Grammys, wins two uh, Grammys for Nick of Time with Bonnie Raitt and a Grammy for Love Shack with the B-52s. And all of a sudden, everybody's calling Don Was to do rec- like Bob Dylan. I did yeah. Bob Dylan's record, Bob Seger, uh, uh, you know, Elton John, and on and on. And all of a sudden, who's this Kenny Aronoff guy? And right. then I w- started really, I mean, I had two drums. So what year are we that, talking about? What year are we talking about? about that was about 19... 19- Nine eighty nine ninety when John when Don made his big break I think it was ninety 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 one somewhere in there, and um, and so then I became a big LA session guy. Then I went after Nashville because I was living in Indiana. I could drive to Nashville in four and a half hours or take a flight, and there was so much money being made that people would fly me all over the world even just for one song. I mean, here's an example of a week. Basically, what I'm saying is I I started another career as a session drummer. And I was making right. more in one day than I was making a whole week on tour with Mellencamp. So you see, now my head's Incredible. going, oh. So, yeah. um, and you're the, diversifying too. You're getting to, to try try new styles, try and play with new players, you know, like work on your chops in various different ways. Well, and, and this is, brings me to the point where you, I became a band guy and then a session guy, but then it got deeper exactly the point you're making all of a sudden now don's hiring me to do johnny cash willie nelson chris christopherson waylon jennings the highwayman now i'm playing on rhythm and country blues where i'm playing with little richard and tanya tucker uh travis tritt and patty labelle uh the staple singles with marty stewart then i'm playing i mean i'm playing with george jones i mean i'm playing with conway twitty's last performance before he died these are real country players this is not like Waylon Jennings' solo record. And for those who don't know, Waylon Jennings, and this guy grew up on a mud floor and picked cotton in, in Texas. It was either Waco or Lubbock, Texas. I don't know where, wherever he came from. It was like, he, uh, he, his lyrics come from a place of, of struggle and, you know, and he's considered one of the most epic artists ever. He was the bass player in the Buddy Holly and the Crickets. No kidding. I didn't and, realize but, that. Yeah, and Buddy was from down there. So he, before he became Waylon, he was the bass player. And the, the, the night that uh, Buddy Holly's plane crashed up there in Iowa, Richie Valens was upset because he wasn't getting a chance to fly on the plane. And Waylon said, okay, let's flip a coin. Waylon lost and Richie died. Holy cow. How about wow. that? So anyway, the, my point is I became diversified i mean there's i played on tony iomi from black sabbath's record with playing used from deep purple i played with alice cooper i did the smashing pumpkin store and i recorded with billy corgan but then i'm playing with the highwaymen but then i played with ray charles then i recorded with the buddy rich big band i played with the boston symphony orchestra i played with the the girls avril lavigne alanis morissette michelle branch celine dion um i played with um you know uh the R&B guys, B.B. King, Buddy Guy, uh, Joe Cocker for 10 years. And it's in uh, seven Kennedy Center honors, but you have to be able to make music. The, the thing that is, resume, it's crazy. Sting, Paul McCartney, Ringo Starr, um, uh, Chris Cornell before he died, you know, uh, I, Lionel Richie, it, 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 the, uh, John Bon Jovi, I mean, Avril Lavigne, uh, oh, uh, what's his name? Uh, did they say Everly Bean? I meant to say Lady Gaga, Bruno Mars, uh, Santana. I mean, everybody. And the thing is, now that is very extraordinary because usually you're pigeonholed. Ah, oh, he's a rock drummer. No, mm. he's a country drummer. No, he's not. Be- and I, the opportunities came my way and I was able to you know, do, do, do good. I mean, I do good and I get the reputation that he can play anything. And that is probably, I, I didn't like calculate this. So I'm extremely uh, grateful. And I step back and go, Oh my God, you did that. Because right. it wasn't like, Oh, Oh, I got to play with Willie Nelson. I'll do anything. 
it happened. Oh man, I would love to play with Tony Iommi from Sabbath. Are you kidding me? I get the call. It's like, holy shit. And to tour with the Pumpkins, people were like, wait a minute. Mellencamp's drummer is touring with the Pumpkins. What is that? <laughs> you know? And I have to say where that came from was when Jimmy Chamberlain, a friend of mine, one of the founding members of the Pumpkins, w w took, uh, had to take a break, had to. Um, when they were on tour doing Melancholy, the biggest, uh, they were the biggest alternative band in the world ever, bigger than Nirvana. They were mm -hmm. huge. And mm -hmm. they, when the drummer went down, I was talking to somebody from Shoko, the president and M ML proceeds said, you heard about uh, Jimmy and the Pumpkins? I said, no. I said, oh my God, I'd love to do that. He says, well, you know, here's the management number. So I faxed them a resume and they said, your goddamn resume took 20 minutes of our fax machine. It was 40 pages long. It, with all the <laughs> I never heard from them. But two years later, I'm in LA at, at uh, uh, a hotel and I get a call from this guy, Sid Bernstein. Hey, Kenny, real nice guy. Not a guy that sounded like he was in Rock Rose. says, my name is Sid Bernstein and I manage the Smashing Pumpkins. I'm like, oh, hi, Sid. I'm like, I'm thinking, Session, Session. I'm going to record the Pumpkins. Because I knew they were making a record, the Adore record. He says, well, as you know, the Pumpkins are making a record, and uh, we're, we're, we're going to audition drummers for the tour. I'm like, um, are you available this summer? I'm, I'm thinking, I don't care what I'm doing. I'm available. Yeah, I am. He says, well, we're going to audition in three weeks or whatever it was. Uh, are you, uh, you want to do it? We're only auditioning five drummers. And I go, I am there. So then he about to hang up and he goes, oh, one more thing. Um, if, if Billy wants you to do the tour, can you say yes? I went, well, I, I probably will say yes, but what are the tour dates? And when are the rehearsal dates? And what am I getting paid? <laughs> you, can't agree. you can't agree to something that you don't know. Sure, sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, I'll do the tour. When is the tour? You know, I mean, so he said, oh, what do you get? I said, I get this and I'll, I'll get back to you. No problem. Mm -hmm. So I audition. Uh, I fly. I fly across the country. I mean, I learned every pumpkin song. I revamped my style of playing, played with lighter sticks, which redesigned my signature stick, play a little bit faster. And when I get there, they don't want me to play one pumpkin song. Billy walks in, it's one in the morning. Uh, Darcy and uh, uh, James Eha were not talking to each other. They weren't talking to me. It was like, whoa. Uh, this wow i recognize this because i've been around so many bands these people needed a break and mm. anyway billy finally walks in he was mixing the adore record he walks in tall like a like a fearless king he's about six four trench coat walks up says kenny nice to meet you billy corrigan takes off his trench coat puts his guitar on and goes so we already know how to play fast and hard i want to play more textural kind of like pink floyd or the grateful dead i'm like oh okay he starts playing kind of like you know kind of like just kind of a melodic you know just vibey stuff so i'm doing cymbals and i start adding toms and i start adding a snare i'm like this is this is not going anywhere so i got to get into a groove and I start getting a groove and it gets heavier. And all of a sudden, Billy gets in that stance where one foot's way forward, the other foot's back. And he's like spread eagle, just crushing it. We get done. And this, in hindsight, I think is what helped me get the deal. I go, in my own natural way, I go, um, well, um, is there anything you'd like me to do for you to make it better? And he smiled. I didn't know what he was smiling about, but I now know. He was smiling, probably going like, wow. I can work with a guy who's asking me, can I do something for you better? Mm. See what I'm mm. saying? You're yeah, only yeah, on, yeah. You're only on stage for two hours. What about the other 22 hours? Mm. And mm. he's thinking, 
Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. I mean, that's what I figured. Not at that time, I didn't. So then we says, just do more of the same thing. Did it. And that was it. That was the audition. But while I'm auditioning, from my perspective, James is looking that way, east. Darcy's looking west. And Billy's in front of me. I'm going, wow, this is, this is not really a band vibe. I guess I'm going to be on tour with the John Fogarty this year again. Mm -hmm. And I, next day I'm in the airport, I get a call from Sid Bernstein. Billy would like you to do the tour with him. I could not believe it. I mean, it was the news. It was everywhere. Every, wow. Every radio, every music. Kenny Aronoff, John Mellencamp's drummer, is playing on the Smashing Pumpkins Adore Tour. It was outrageous. So Wow. So how did that, did that dynamic start to shift over time? Or was, was there still kind of that, that sort of heaviness going on with them, with Billy and it was no, was it, like it, did, it, did things change or was the energy did the energy move or, or what no. Here's, no here's 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 from my experience with being on so many tours remember i told you with Mellencamp, we do we did two years of one record this the, the cycle of yeah. writing songs arranging recording doing videos touring take a month off and start again yeah well after eight years john was burnt he was losing his mind because he's everything went through him. You don't realize he was dealing with the managers, with the lawyers. He was dealing with the, the, the promotion people, doing with interviews. He was dealing with every single decision went through him mm. and he performed. Right. All I did was perform. Right. Try to get laid, you know I mean? <laughs> so he, he, he was really like, he was fried. Well, mm -hmm. this band was fried. It'd been eight years. They did or something close to it, they did Gish, Siamese Dream, Melancholy, the biggest alternative. It was, a, it was a double CD that, it was 8 million, but it's a double CD, so that's, you know, 36 million records sold. These guys were fried. They needed to take a break, but from a business standpoint, how do you walk away from a record that's done so well, you've got to follow it up. You've got to go back on tour. Your audience is waiting for you. You, 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 if you take too much time off, unless you're Bruce Springsteen or, or Bob Seger was the classic, he tour every 10 years and somehow sell out arenas. Nowadays, if you wait 10 years, nobody knows who the, people don't even know who the Beatles are. Young kids don't even know who the Beatles are. And yet they right. were like so huge. So right. anyway, they needed a break. And when I got on that, G four or five, whatever we were flying on all over the world. Holy shit. The vibe was thick. I thought I was like, Hey, if anybody wants to ask me, I can tell you what you're going through, but mm. of course they're not going to ask me. And what they were going through, it would needed a break. So anybody, right. whatever their poison was, it got exaggerated, whatever their mental health was, it got exaggerated. I had seen it before. I knew it. Uh, which helped me understand it. But, you know, it was, uh, they were going through a tough time and understandably, you know, it just, and we're flying literally in three countries in one day. We played, I remember we played in Ireland and all of you two came and we hung out with Bono and, and you know, uh, Larry Mullins Jr. is a friend of mine and the Edge and, and uh, we, we were playing really weird venues, small. And they were right there and they were watching. And uh, Larry Mullins, you know, he, he started YouTube pretty much. Very smart man. He looked at me afterwards and went, I can tell the dynamics of that whole band. <laughs> he could see, because he was, a, he's, you know, in a band. He sure, of course. Everything that was yeah. going, he brilliantly nailed it. Now, I won't mm. say what it was he said, but I was like, wow, okay, yeah. all right. So anyway, we're, the next day I wake up, with a nice hangover and we fly <laughs> to the Netherlands, maybe Holland, the Pink Pop Festival. It's like huge, like maybe three, five stages. I don't know, we're playing in front of 250,000 people. I and mean, we were the, 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 the headliners and it, you know, people go, and we start off, we did the whole Adore tour basically, uh, the, the album, which was, the fans were a little bit disappointed. They wanted to hear the hits we did. 
kind of a version of bullets to but butterflies, but uh, I came up with the whole approach of more like a Marilyn Manson way. You know, that's the the world is a vampire. Boom, 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 boom. I don't just uh, boom. I started by hitting these big ass drum. <laughs> The world is a vampire. It was kind of like beautiful people that the mailman. So we drove it like in a punk. The world is a vampire. Really cool. And we did a couple other songs, and that was it. But the audience went nuts, and we went from that, got in our limos, and got on a plane and flew to France. And so we were in three countries in one day. We, we were like all over the world. Greece one day, Russia another day, back to, you know, Frankfurt. Uh, it was down to South America. We were zigzagging. It was, a, it was not an easy uh, tour, but I was unbelievably grateful. I got to play with the Smashing Pumpkins, who I just absolutely thought were the cutting edge and coolest, you know, band. And for me to get that opportunity. So, you know, this diversity to get back to, you know, session guy, uh, uh, a, a band guy, um, and stylistically all over the place. And, um, and uh, you know, I've always, uh, I talk about this a lot when I speak. It's like, you've got to, to stay relevant, you've got to be able to adapt and adjust over and over and over and over and over again to stay relevant. And that's exactly what's happening right now. That's how I have embraced adversity and, and been able to, as, as Ken had mentioned, uh, he said, gain confidence. It's not gaining, it's sustaining confidence because I'm a confident guy. So I'm not trying to gain it. I'm just sustaining it by being right. active doing things like what we're doing and and engaging in and right. I'll explain where that came from but um yeah and it's, it's like it, one form of confidence isn't necessarily going to apply to the next thing like right now what we're experiencing with the whole covid thing is you know the confidence that someone may have had coming into this they might have lost their job they might have lost all their savings. Now that confidence that they may have built up in that one area that they felt confident yes. in is gone because they haven't really been able to adapt. And so what you're speaking to right now is something that I love speaking to on this, on this podcast around adversity and, and uh, di diversity and being able to pivot and be able to move and having that mindset that can be you know, that, that neuroplasticity to be able to go, okay, that road is now done. That is no longer happening. Like I can either sit back and mope and be anxious and depressed that that situation is no longer happening, or I can see where the opening is. And that's something that fascinates me about you just as much as your drumming itself is throughout your career, you've been making these pivots. And yeah. like when you pivoted from classical and then, and then, and then not only making these pivots, but your determination too. Like I was reading in uh, uh, about when you first auditioned for Mellencamp, how he initially turned you down. And then you were like, no, 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 no. You're not gonna turn me down. Basically like you were, you were like, I'm gonna show up. To, so speak to that. I wanna, I wanna hear that story. Okay, here, here's, let's, and I didn't get a chance to talk about this uh, uh, in metal. What I was going to was, okay, Everything you said is spot on, okay? And you have to be able to pivot. All right. For me, and I can only speak for me, it is not, it's, it's not natural for humans to go into danger. You run from danger. You yeah. run when you feel fear. But the Marines have learned how to run into bullets. Yeah. Firemen have learned how to run into a burning fire. People... I don't get it. They jump out of airplanes with parachutes. You, it's not natural to jump out of an airplane, but you learn to do that. Well, at age 18, I was in a serious fear of going to school because in my family, when you go graduate high school, you go to college. You didn't know discussion. 
was, you know, my dad fought in World War II. He did the last 15 missions that took Hitler out in bombers. So, you know, and his grandfather came from Russia. And so there was not, you know, so you, you go to school and you get an education and get a job in the field you study in, which I did. So, but there was no rock and roll back then. There was no rock and roll drum set teachers. It was all new. I saw the Beatles at age 10 on TV and I went, I want to do that. And that ignited my purpose in life without even knowing what that meant. And I'm asking my mom to call the Beatles up and get me in the band. And she, what? No, I don't know. I don't have the number. <laughs> so I started my own band and didn't, didn't even realize that I was, I guess I was born with like, no is not acceptable. And mm. I have a fight or fight attitude, which will bring me to the Mellencamp story. So when she said, no, I went, well, I'm going to start my own band and play Beatles music. And I did. So when it was time to go to college, I had taken some lessons for two years with the percussionist from the Boston Symphony Orchestra. I just did it because some, uh, in my little town of 3,000 people, and the Boston Symphony Orchestra had their summer festival at Tangwood, which was three miles from my house in the Berkshires, Western Mass. And a couple of guys that were drummers, was, they were getting a little bit crispier and better technique. And I went, what are you doing? I'm taking lessons with this guy. So I started taking lessons with the guy and it was, it was grueling. I mean, he literally first lesson, he's like, uh, what's your name? I said, Kenny, Kenny, what? Uh, Kenny Aronoff. What have you prepared for me today? I'm like, nothing. You don't have a, a, a mallet piece. I'm like, I don't play mallets. What are mallets? Marimba vibes. I don't play it. Have you prepared a timpani piece for me? I says, I don't play timpani. And I'm going, he goes, well, what do you do? And I go, I play drums. Well, come down to my basement, play me some drums. 30 seconds, he whips me off the set, points to a uh, you know, rubber pad. We're going to start from the beginning. Now, that was a pivotal moment where I could have gone, I'm out of here. Dude, I'm like three varsity jock. I'm one of the most popular guys in school. I got a rock band. My brother, twin brothers, the president of the senior class. I'm vice president. I got long hair. I got chicks. I mean, I don't need this. But I didn't. I, for some reason, I went, I do need this. And I started studying with him. Got me good enough to get into the University of Massachusetts School of Music. And the day I graduated high school, and this is the lesson. The day I graduated high school, I was terrified that I was going to be behind. And I was. My reading skills weren't great. My technique on these instruments, classical music. I had kids were in marching bands. I didn't have nothing to do with marching band in high school. Kids were in little orchestras. I had nothing to do. I was in a rock band. I was playing in clubs when I was 13. Why would I want to play with squeakly clarinets and flutes? And pfft, that wasn't cool. But now I was going to be in school with these guys. And they were way ahead of me. And I knew it. So I started practicing eight hours a day, seven days a week. I still have the piece of paper checking off. A couple of days I did six hours because I was playing five nights a week with a jazz trio. The point is, and that is the lesson that I learned was to build confidence and to make me feel good. I just worked my ass off. And I still had the fear in me because I knew I was behind and there wasn't enough time to catch up. But the point is I have used that approach just like a running back in football just keep pounding it and pounding it and pounding it because it makes this person here feel confident and like i'm doing something i'm accomplishing something i'm doing the best i can I'm, my body's aching i'm sweating i'm putting as much time as i can to be better and you see the results but the bottom line is I feel good about myself as opposed to doing nothing and just worrying. And I've taken that and I've applied it to every single adverse situation I'm in. And that's what I'm doing right now with the, the COVID thing. So when somebody goes, God, Kenny, man, I hope you're all right. I'm like, dude, you don't even know who I am. For you to, for you to say that means you don't know who Kenny Aronoff is. Dude. Right. Right. Of course I'm all right. Because I right. do pivot. I understand that they're, they're worried because they know that the whole music business is shut down. But no, I'm I. Yeah, I've lost a lot of money, big six figure monies. But doesn't it does matter. But the point is, is that I'm every day I'm in my studio, I'm recording. I've got coffee 
coming out. I did the mask thing. I've got, you know, a podcast. I got, you know, this and that and that. And it's just going on and on and on. So every day I feel good about myself. And like you said, if you take action now, in a year from now, while we're standing on a mountain and looking down at the people that didn't do anything, and they've got to try to climb this mountain that we're already on top of. Absolutely. So one of the things that I'm hearing you say, and you must have a lot of experience with flow state, because when you, for those who don't know about the science of flow state, flow state is a state of consciousness that is, for most people, they never even get to experience it. But for the lucky few, sometimes it's through extreme sports, sometimes it's through music. It's a state of mind where it's like, everything slows down and you become so totally present your thoughts just go away all your anxieties go away all the all the judgment all the 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 mental you know stuff that we normally associate with being a human being all slows down and goes away and you just become fully present and you just described the two elements that are the components it's been studied scientifically it is the combination of being highly skilled with something and then having something that is just enough of a challenge that it pushes that skill to where you have to pay such close attention that your brain literally just all of the other stuff that you're normally accustomed to thinking about just goes away and you just experience yourself fully in the moment. So when I think about the combination of the skill of all of the hours that you put into becoming one of the best drummers in the world, plus the challenges that you've experienced in terms of the diversity taking on all of these new forms of, of music, like having to learn entirely new forms of music. And then the challenges of showing up when, you know, I'm sure a lot of the time you're kind of exhausted with being on the road and so forth and all of that. And there's a challenge to show up fully. And then you add on top of that, the rhythm, being in the moment, having the timing, like you have your timing has to be on like no other when you're a musician, especially a drummer, is yeah. timing. That is all it is, is timing. Yeah. It's timing plus artistry. And so when you think about that, like I would imagine that you must have experienced so much flow throughout the course of your career. And, and you, just, you just know how to cultivate that. And then you know how to take that and bring it into your ordinary life, too. Yeah, there's no question. And I know that that feeling of flow. What I do is I'm aware of how valuable flow is. So I'm always trying to get in flow. But I've learned to uh, step back and observe myself as if I'm the in the audience or the producer of the band or whatever I'm in or a coach. I'm the coach and the player. I observe the whole game. And I'm in flow, but I'm, I'm, I'm present enough so that, bam, there's a problem. I go, I don't leave flow state, but I go right into fixing the problem. It's like you're racing a car and you're in flow, but all of a sudden you got to uh, fix the engine. So you, 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 you step your hand over and you fix the engine while you're racing and you go put a lot of concentration in that and then go back into 100% flow. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's the skill that I learned when I was on tour with Melissa Etheridge in 1996. I had to learn a three hour show with nine hours of rehearsal. I had written, I was doing tons of sessions and I was writing, uh, the, I took the board tape cause she'd already been on tour for three years, took a board tape and wrote everything out. So I knew all the arrangements. And she looked at me one day, we were playing in front of 15,000 people. And she says, I can tell when you're reading and when you're not. I went, the difference is when you're not reading, I'm in flow. And when I'm reading, I was not in flow as much because I'm reading. So if, a, uh, if you're in flow, a glass is full of water. When you're reading, a percentage of that water is focusing on, uh, on the, yeah. the reading. So you now you've got maybe only 80% in flow. So that taught me, holy shit. Okay, I'm going to have to observe myself from a distance. And if I sound like I'm not in flow, you make adjustments to sound like you're in flow. <laughs> it got yes. to that level. Yes. But the flow thing is very important, but you've got to be somewhat present to, uh, to deal with adversity and fix problems. I'm a, I mean, that's, what, that's my job when I do these big TV shows where I play with 25 artists, Kennedy Center Honors, 
seven years in a row, something goes wrong with something like Elton John or, or you know, or Bruce Springsteen or Sting, and something, you know, the band is impeccable, everybody reads great, everybody can make adjustments, everybody is professional, uh, it's everybody, you got to move fast, you got to be quick, you don't have that many rehearsals, they're changing stuff right up to the last second, the President of the United States is there, you got dignitaries uh, and Hollywood there, you don't fuck up or you don't come back next year yes that's yes. the primo yes. super bowl team something inevitably will go wrong in a, when you're honoring an artist there's seven artists singing so walk in walks dave Grohl. then all of a sudden he does his song and then in walks rob thomas he does his song and then comes the next artist and it's like Oh my God, you know, and I've got everything figured out. I, I've got the script of the show. I've talked to the stage manager, the musical director, and the producer. I know when to count off. Is Tom Hanks talking after he says, and the, I start counting. I've got tempos. While I'm playing one song, I'm adjusting the tempo for the next song. I have notes. Remember, I'm, I'm reading this song, but I got notes for the next song, or I've already, it's, it's, I've got every detail written out because you don't want to make a mistake. But something inevitably, one thing will go wrong. An artist will forget something and I've got to cover. I've got to, yes. well, here I'll give you an example, We're honoring Neil Diamond. I won't mention the artist, but you're supposed to hold a note for six beats. Ah, and I come bring the band in. He went, ah, went, whoa, threw me off. I didn't count. I'm looking at the MD and he's going like, hold, like he was supposed to hold that note. He's not. And I went, problem mayday mayday fix it i went boom and brought the band in at the end of that whole segment they keep us in our chairs it's the last part of the kennedy center honors performance where they've honored five different artists they keep us in the chairs and the md says something i can't hear and i go yeah yeah i i, I should have counted maybe i didn't count six beats i wasn't counting it and he goes he didn't hear me and he goes blah 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 and i go yeah 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 and then all of a sudden he gets word from up to, up up top and the producer and he goes everybody thank kenny aronoff he saved the day and what had happened was yeah i wasn't counting but i brought the band in i immediately recognized we have a problem singer didn't hold a note everybody's waiting i can bring the band in like i was supposed to might have been six weeks. I don't know. I think it sounded great when I saw the pl playback. And after I, the, the trumpet player, just badass trumpet player, comes and says, dude, thank God you brought us in. But see, my point is, I didn't expect that to happen, but I did expect that something could go wrong. Yes, you know? yes. So that flow yes. thing is huge. It's huge. the best, best way to do anything, but you want to be aware uh, you want to have your your one foot on the ground or enough uh, observation that if you something's not going right that you can accommodate. It'd be like a mountain climber going boo doo 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 up with no ropes, and all of a sudden, if he's not aware that an avalanche is coming down, <laughs> he'll just keep yeah. going up until the avalanche hits him. Yes, yeah. and you had the chops to be able to apply immediate confidence. So when you sensed something was going wrong, it wasn't like uh oh. Like you could go, uh oh, but then you could immediately hit. Yeah, and it's, it's like the, the uh oh, it, the uh oh, put in, didn't put you into the into a reaction. The uh oh put you into a response. Yes, and, so, and that's the difference between flow and when you just freeze. You know, and a lot of people, if they're less confident, they were just frozen in that situation. Yeah. Well, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? But you were like, yeah. boom. Okay, here I am. I'm ready to go. I've oftentimes talked about it in my coaching work, like like we're the, both the actors and the directors in our lives. Like if you look at it like a movie, yeah. you know, there's like this, the, the character yeah. going through the drama of life. Yeah. And then there's the director sitting back behind the scenes going, yeah, well, this is how he would handle this situation right now to make the most of this situation. Yeah. You know, and, and, I, and I hear that that's exactly what you did. You just, you responded rather than freezing. And that made all the difference. Absolutely. Like, like you said, I'm the actor and the director. I'm the player and the coach. And, yeah. and it's not about, it's about recognize the problem, but immediately go to solution. Yes. If you yes, stay yeah. in problem, you won't salute, make a solution necessarily. You'll be focusing on the problem. We only have so many seconds right there for me. I gotta, I gotta come up with a solution now and I know it. You know, yes. and so, yeah, it's a fight or fight attitude. It's like there's only one way, and that is straight. 
you know i i like that you took the the fight or flight the fight flight or freeze thing that is typically talked about in terms of the sympathetic reaction to a fight or fight like i'm here either way i'm going to be present rather than go into some kind of reactive re reaction to this situation and, and that's the mellencamp story when john told me for people listening you know i i, I graduated i ended up graduating uh I did one year at UMass and I ended up at the number one school of music in the country, Indiana University, for, by auditioning and uh, de de demanding to myself that I want to be in the best school if I'm going to do this. So I got into Indiana University, did four years, and I actually auditioned every year for four years to go to the number one student orchestra in the country, run by Tanglewood, the boss, I mean, run by the Boston Symphony Orchestra at Tanglewood, which was where the, my percussionist uh, who taught me was playing in the summer. I, I, I struck out the first year I auditioned, struck out the second year, struck out the third year, fourth year I went and auditioned and got in. They only took seven percussionists in the whole world. I kicked ass. I graduated Indiana University. I get into the Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra. And a very, I bring this story up because a very, very heavy point I want to make here is my brain said you should go to Jerusalem and be in the orchestra. Your parents invested a lot of money in your education. You, you got a touchdown. You got a job in the field you studied. There aren't that many orchestras. You've really gone from shit to Shinola. I mean, you, you went from like not very skillful and a beginner to getting into an orchestra in Israel. Come on. And I turned it down because let's revert back to the Beatles. I followed my heart. I followed my passion. I followed what really my purpose in life was. Thank God. I turned down certainty for uncertainty. I turned down certainty for complete possibility. And thank God I did, but it was not an easy four years. Four years. I practiced at home. I went back home humbly with my, you know, practicing eight hours a day, studying in New York and Boston, drum set. At these, the University of Indiana didn't have a drum set teacher. I played drum set all the time, but I was studying timpani five hours a day and orchestra and conducting and sight singing and piano and music history, music literature. I mean, it just goes on and on. And uh, that school, in order, it's hard to get in, but it's harder to stay in. It, that's why it's number one. You're being mm -hmm. tested every semester. Are you Indiana material? If you're not, they weed you out like the Marines or the Navy SEALs. They'll weed wow. you out, man. That's why yeah. they're number one. They have the best students there. Anyway, yeah. I moved back to Indiana and form a band. The business model, we're going to make music. We're going to get a record deal. We're going to tour like the Beatles and make records. It's going to be unbelievable. Well, after three years of that and living in a little band house, where my rent was 62 bucks a month and living off of peanut butter and tuna fish. Uh, I went, I'm 27. I got to move to New York or LA. I decided I'm going to move to New York. And I, I, long and short of it, I hear about this Johnny Cougar guy who's on MTV and he just fired his drummer. I auditioned and get the gig. Uh, I wrote every note out. I, I wooed him. But five weeks later, we're in LA making a record. I'm telling everybody I've made it. I did it. I did it. And after two days of recording, I get fired because the producer, I thought John fired me. I mean, he's the one that delivered the message. What it was, the producer said, I got eight weeks to make this record. We're not record we're recording on tape. So back then, the drummer had to play from beginning to end, perfectly in time, perfect groove, perfect parts, perfect balance on the kit, perfect, perfect time, perfect everything, and be able to take uh, criticism and and change this and do that and do this and do, you had to have great equipment you had to have know how to tune your drums you had to be with, playing the relevant grooves and beats and sounds and everything I had zero experience the purpose of a drummer in a session is one thing it, especially back then get the goddamn song on the radio to be number one it ain't about me it's about we it's about the band and that song. And it's not about how do I sound? And you want to focus on how you sound, but it's for the purpose of getting that song on the radio. And I didn't have enough experience. I'd worked with Leonard Bernstein, the conductor, composer, Arthur Fiedler, uh, Aaron Copeland, got into the Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra, won a concerto competition. I mean, I had nothing to do with playing drums in the studio 
with an artist that gets on the radio. I had no experience. So when John is telling me, I'm at the Chateau Marmont there on Sunset, I'll never forget that room. John is telling me, you go home. That's when I said, I ain't going nowhere. And back then, I was like freaking. I was fearful. I was ashamed, overwhelmed, sad, bummed out, loser, failure, all the negative emotions that a child goes through. And I didn't have the skill to understand any of that except that he was trying to take away my purpose in life, which was to play in a rock and roll band, make records and tour. And so I just like got in that fight mode and didn't know what else to say, but say, no, I'm not, I'm not going home. Then I started going, I remember, because when I said that, that'd be like saying no to a drill sergeant, a Marine drill sergeant says, give me a hundred pushups. You go, no, <laughs> or you're fired. No, I'm not. What? I just fired you. You're fired. No, I'm not. What What don't you understand about you are fired? And I'm going, no. You don't. So then I start like just completely like, well, well, am I still your drummer or what? And he's all nervous and kind of like, and the band is like, holy shit. And John goes, well, you are, but you're not playing on the record. And then I'm going like, well, I'm panicking, like trying to figure out how I'm going to negotiate a deal that serves us both. I go, well, I'm going to go in the studio and I'm going to watch those drummers play my parts and I'm going to learn from them. I'm going to get better and I'll benefit from that experience and, and you'll benefit because I'm your drummer. Silence. I'm like, shit. All right. I'll work for free, sleep on the floor. And that's where I went, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so did that happen? Hey, did you end up working yeah. for free and sleeping on the floor? I didn't sleep on the floor. I got a bed. <laughs> you got a bed. <laughs> but I was, I was, um, I said, I, I, well, you I, did work for free. It was horribly humble. I mean, think wow. I accomplished so much and it was such a huge, important life lesson. I could have easily gone home. If I'd gone home, maybe I would have found another drummer. Uh, I, John said in my autobiography, he, he really admired me for, sticking up to him. He's a tough guy, man. I mean, yeah. I learned so much from John. He, he wasn't always, he, he had a, he's not known as the happiest guy in the world, but yeah. I look back now, I have not one negative thing. Even there's a lot you could be negative about, I don't because it's, it's brought me to where I am and the experiences was unbelievable. And you know, and, and the happy ending to that story, by the way, is I, I swore I was going to be on the next record and it took two years to make the next, to, until we even started making next record. And I wasn't the popular guy in the band because uh, I was the new guy. I was the green guy. I had, I had to prove myself. I had to live for two years thinking about how I'm going to prove myself. Meanwhile, I had been treated like a, a king at, at Indiana University and everything I did. And this was major life lesson on I want this so bad, I'm willing to deal with the shit. But it really... Th that experience is still helping me formulate who I am in this short life we live in. And uh, it just gets better and better for me. As I look back, there's no bitterness. There's no negativity. It's all great. There's, I personally don't believe at this point in my life, there are any mistakes or failures. Those are just experiences that bring you to where you are. And if you have that outlook on it, you can really, everything's a gift. So I, 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 I long and short of it is it two years later I'm making this record with John American Fool two guys got fired I almost got a fist fight with John it was the most uh, difficult record nine weeks in the studio we don't have a record done John calls up Aaron off we don't have a fucking record yet I'm like ah! that's like going to like Desert Storm and coming back alive and they say you know what you got to go back again oh shit so we eventually come back to LA finished record and one that record came out won two grammys and i'm in that room that i got fired in at the chateau marmont and i get a phone call jack and diane just went to number one wow. you are on the number one single in america right now now back then in 1982 when you were number one it wasn't some stupid chart you know that has only you know, you're number one, you've sold 50 albums. This meant you're selling millions of records and you 
There aren't that many charts. So when you're number one, you're on all radio stations, all MTV, Saturday Night Live. You're on every, you just, you're the shit. You are the greatest. And That is so cool. That is so cool. You know, oh, go ahead, go ahead. The go big ahead. takeaway was after two seconds of excitement, I went, shit, how am I going to do that again? How do you do <laughs> yeah. it again? How yeah, do you I'm following that up? Following up, and I'm like, you need, I need to hear the song to do it again. And this is no. So I was left with, oh my God, I'm number one for one second. And I looked at my so I have a phrase, it goes like this I'll never be as great as I want to be, but I'm willing to spend the rest of my life trying to be as great as I can be. In other words, being number one was just that second. I was number on a number one single. Now, if I want to be really number one all the time, I've got to keep fighting for that. And it's not going to always happen. It's like a running back. He doesn't get a touchdown every time, but he keeps trying. That's me. That is so cool. You know, it's, and it's all from taking one potentially humiliating experience and turning it into a humbling experience. Yeah. Hunger, hunger and humble and hung, I'm humble and hungry. Yeah. Humble and hungry. Yeah. Instead of humiliated, you end up being humble and hungry. I love yeah. that, man. But wow. see, now I, now I understand it. So, you know, yeah. you know you, 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 I'm sure you can relate. So when you know that feeling of like, we always go back to our, being a child, you go, ah, oh, shit. And now I go, oh, that's, that's how you, you feel when you're a kid. Now, the adult in me goes, okay, we don't want to, you're not going to get rid of those feelings. But instead of what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do with that feeling, I feel like shit. I'm going to say, oh, well, Kenny, that's just part of life experience. And this is how you're going to become great. This thing. So just pacify that. I feel like shit and replace it with like, we're getting better. We're getting better, man. That was a good thing. I experienced, I won't do that again. Turn it into a positive. So that it just, the immediate reaction, my, I decided this is how I'm going to deal with it. And the more I, I do that exercise, the more this gets a little closer. And so it becomes more spontaneous. And so, yeah, I mean, you go like, boy, like touring ended suddenly, you know, for the, the whole year. And the first thing is like, really? And then I go, okay, what are we going to do about this? I went right back to 18 years old. Make schedule. How did COVID affect me? What am I going to do about all these things that it's affecting me with? And then I start attacking them and I start feeling good about myself. That's awesome, man. So you're taking every single situation that could potentially be seen as a negative and using it for grist for the mill for like, how do I take this and pivot, take this, pivot, take this, pivot. And, and, and it's like, that's how you're not losing time. You're not losing time and you're not losing energy. Interesting to think about it as losing time too, as a drummer, you're not, you're not falling off the beat. You know, you're like, you're staying on the beat the whole time through. And I love how all of this can be applied no matter whether you're a musician, no matter what, I mean, this, these are fundamental principles yes. that can be applied universally. And yes. it's all about, you know, what you're speaking to is, you know, so much of exactly what I speak to in my coaching all the time is that observer mindset, being able to be mindful, taking that observer approach and seeing the, 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 the person that you think that you are going through the drama of your life. And then also looking at it through that larger perspective and going, ah, this is just learning. This is just learning. This is just putting me in a new direction. This is putting me in a new direction. This is diversifying my attention. This is making me a more intelligent person. This is making me a more adaptable person, which like you said, people don't want to put themselves in danger. We have a natural uh, uh, defense around dangerous situations. Uh, the, the animal in us just wants to be safe, but that's going to kill us. It's going to drain us. And especially you know, when, when things are the way they are right now in the world and everything's changing, we have to get used to an entirely different mindset of being able to pivot, being able to stay on that beat every moment of every day. What is, uh, like, you're coaching somebody, do you find, what percentage of the people you work with that get it when you say it to them or they're just like, they don't have it, in which case, you know, you, the only way they will get it is if they they actually digest it and understand it. How many people? Well, the, well that's that's the get? thing. I would say a hundred percent get it conceptually. You know, it's like because these are intelligent people, they're amb ambitious people. 
they'll get it conceptually, but then it's the embodiment of it that takes time because yeah. it's like, you got to train that, that animal in you that wants to stay safe. That, that part of you that just wants to like go, Oh no, please don't make anything change. I like the certainty. I like my, you know, I like things going the way they are, even though I hate the way that things are going. I yeah, still, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like it. You know, like they, they, they're, they're comfortable, comfortable, with, comfortable. They're comfortable with the shit that they hate. And it's like, they would rather stick with the shit that they hate and be comfortable yeah. than, you know, put themselves like <laughs> jump over the ledge and be a little bit uncomfortable, but actually have a much better life. And so, yeah, it's, I see this all the time. And, and this is the, the thing that I'm, I'm constantly working with people on. Like, hey, like, take, take some risks. You know, what's the worst that can happen? You'll die. Then you won't, it won't matter anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do you, exactly. Which is going to happen. Do yeah. you uh, find that uh, once, like, one of your clients, and they probably have already experienced it, but you have to remind them, do you find that once somebody... It's, and to me, it's like they feel one thing is mental when they yeah. hear it from you. The next thing is to feel it because they've gone That's through exactly the process. It. Yeah, the you got to feel it. And you got to be able to be with that vulnerability that that brings up for you because it's going to bring up that fear and you got to be able to hold that fear and not pop out. Yeah. You know, be able to be with that fear just like you did in the Kennedy Center Awards, being yeah. with that fear, but not popping out of yourself, responding to it. Yeah. It takes, yeah. It takes practice, but then you have to step back and recognize that that did work when I did that. Yeah. And how do I feel when I got through that? And uh, it's just learning to fly, I guess, you know, or learning to do anything that is uh, uncomfortable, but it just really gets down to, do you want the results? It's a, it's a hard thing to measure, but you're right. I mean, people where they feel where's that line where they'd rather suffer and be because they're used to that feeling, but they're miserable and suffering uh, wh wh where they can, where is that line where they'll actually take a leap of faith and try to try to do it differently with the hopes that they're going to feel different. And, and they really will feel different. And they went, <laughs> if they just, and it's just practice. It's just doing, doing, I think it's doing it a, a little bit here and there, doing it a little bit over and over and over again. And like you said, I mean, you just spoke to it perfectly. It's that practice of having done it and then go, oh, wow, that wasn't so bad. Like yeah. that thing that I feared happening never happened. Yeah. I'm actually totally fine. I actually feel really, I feel much better now. And so then you start to get that feedback that the thing that you're afraid to do actually tends to work out just fine it's like what did mark twain say he said something about like i've i've worried about so many things over the course of my i can't remember what the exact yeah. line is but i've worried about so many things over the course of my life most of which never happened yeah. <laughs> i love that <laughs> so course, so you know, we're, no go ahead go ahead no, you go ahead oh i was i was just gonna say we've spoken a lot about um principles that apply universally no matter who you are yeah. um, i'm wondering you know for people out there i'm sure there's going to be some musicians out there drummers and other musicians who are going i'm listening i've got the chance to listen to kenny aronoff right now i want to know how i can survive as a musician in this current era and uh and you're surviving i mean like you said you have the the benefit of a, a long career um but you also spoke to how, how uncertain things are in the music industry these days. And it's changing uh, just, as much as, just as much or more than like any industry out there. So what are your thoughts right now on being a professional musician, on making money as a musician and finding some kind of security to at least be able to live your life and, and keep pursuing your dream? Well, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to tell it how it is. I mean, it's a, it's a rough, rough time for the musician in that to make a living because, you know, uh, you know, records are free uh, to get people to purchase your record. It's just, it's going to be very difficult to change the mindset of the buyer who's used to getting something for free for so long and right. saying, you know, you, you I want to charge this for it. So, the, the the recording the, the selling of product is is a tough one um and then now the pandemic has made it so we can't play live which was 
pretty much where everybody was making most of their money. So that's kind of created, you know, uh, you know, making it way more difficult. The thing is, is that I suggest to people do whatever you have to do to make money now. Could be anything, Starbucks, work at Ralph's. I don't care what it is. You make money so that you can play your music every day. You know, go home and, and blow it out for two hours. Uh, keep the dream alive. Keep your, it, 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 you may not be able to support yourself playing music right now, but you can keep that joy and love in your heart right now. So when this, we figure out how to get back into venues and uh, cause we will eventually, uh, you will still be, you'll be, you, you'll learn to play your instrument better in this time. You'll, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll write songs, whatever you, whatever your part in music is, you cannot stop. You just may not be able to make the living you wanted to. Now, from a business standpoint, there is no question. We all know this, but you know, I mean, look at social media as a digital platform and not just social media, you know, uh, the social media, it's, it's, it, 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 to me, it's like, it's not social media. It's, it's a digital platform where I would, uh, it, people let people know what I'm up to, where I'm going. And eventually if you're an artist and you want to like make a YouTube channel and have your music up there, uh, you're trying to get mo a lot of followers that may someday turn into a monetary thing, your social media, you know, your Twitter, your Instagram, your, your Facebook, uh, your tick, you know, uh, what is it? What's tick, uh, TikTok or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. TikTok, tick, yeah. TikTok, TikTok. Yeah. 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 And, and, uh, uh, you know, like it or not, and I was talking to Sasha about that, and we got in a breakout. He said, "Doesn't matter if you like it; it exists. Mm -hmm. Do it." Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what you're trying to do is get people to see you as an artist, and then you can make videos and you send them to your YouTube channel. The idea is to get numbers. I'll give you an example. My agent goes uh, trying to to. Uh, He's discussing with a, an event planner or a corporation. Uh, you really should have Kenny Aronoff. He's a great team leader. He talks about team leadership, communication skills. He talks about innovation, creativity, and uh, he's, he performs drums. He's got a great message, but he's easy to work with, easy to, to talk to, and, he, and, and it's exciting because he plays the drums during his event. And she says, well, what's his name? Kenny Aronoff. What do you think this lady went? She didn't go to my website. She went to Instagram. So Instagram says 100 top drummers ever. Rolling Stone magazine. Oh, geez, that's pretty good. 300 million records sold. Wow, that many? Holy, author, speaker. She knows immediately now, oh, and then how many numbers or people are following me? It's not huge, but it's 47,000. It's got the blue check mark. She'll go, okay, this guy's legitimate. Goes to Twitter. 191,000 followers, goes to Facebook. I can't remember what I got on my fan page. Obviously my personal page. This is going, okay, okay, I'm getting to see who this guy is. Oh, let's go and do his website or LinkedIn. LinkedIn, he's got a LinkedIn profile. Oh, says the same sort of thing as on Instagram. All right, he's got that many followers on LinkedIn. Oh my God, this guy's a, he's a, he's a player. All right, we'll go, so that's about 300,000 people following him. Let's go to his website. Oh, geez, look at him, he's speak. And then, but they went right to, Instagram first. That's what my, uh, you know, my agent said. So mm -hmm. there to me went, all right, you know, this is real. They're going there first. I've got to be there. That's why I, I did, I did, I made sure that the picture and what few bullet points were there would describe to somebody who doesn't know who I am. It was funny. I mean, in, um, Esquire magazine, they did an article on me once. It was like, the most famous drummer you've never heard of. And my mom was like, that's horrible. I'm like, no, it's very accurate. That's the guy that go like, that's a guy with the glasses. He's on every show on Access TV. I saw him on the Kennedy Center. Oh my God, he's on Letterman. Who is that guy? He looks like Paul Schaefer. It's like, exactly. They know right. me, but they don't know my name because right. I'm the guy in the back. And right, right. You're hanging with the John John Bonhams and the Neil Peart's out there in terms of your 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 skills yeah. and your expertise. You're just lesser known because of the you know yeah you're yeah yeah. I'm not the guy up front. I don't have my own talk show. I don't have. I'm not the singer. It's like not the Kenny Aronoff band. 
<laughs> right, right, right. Absolutely. The Smashing Pumpkins, Kenny plays with Smashing Pumpkins, plays with Bob Seger, plays with Bob Dylan. You know, so anyway, the point totally. is, so for the, 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 I guess the main takeaway is, and this is what I'm doing myself, very successful drummer. I am recording, so I can make money doing that. And I've got other ways of making money as a musician. But uh, I, what I definitely do every day is I come in here and I do an hour of technique and I do either an hour or two hours of, of music to keep my game going, to right, keep right. me this is what I do. This right. is who I am. So I'm being responsible to myself. This is how you stay disciplined and in shape. I'm not going to wait until Joe Satriani says, okay, we're going to do the tour now. Oh my God, I got to get in shape. And not, and I'll, not only do I do that here, uh, but you know, I, I work out. I have a gym right. in my house. I keep the foundation I talked about yesterday had the eight steps to a healthy life. I know everybody's heard it before, but guess what, folks? It's like the Ten Commandments. Have you heard, have you heard them too much? Throw them away? Done with it? No, they're there because they are the right guidelines to remind us, oh, yeah, I didn't work out for two days. Shit, I got to go back to that. Oh, I'm not drinking enough water. I'm not sleeping enough. They're only there to remind you. They never get old because there are those huge, important guidelines to surviving. And operating. That's so true. So true. You know, one of the things that I'm hearing you say that you haven't said, but but I'm hearing you say it is that, you know, it's going to set in terms of musicians. And this, I guess this also applies to other disciplines as well. But in terms of musicians, this is going to separate out those who really care about music from those who want to just get a quick, you know, try to make get a record deal and get famous. And that's a big difference. Like, I'm actually kind of excited about that in a way. Like, if you can't, you know, if it's impossible or less and less possible to pursue music just so that you can get famous and have people adore you and try to make all kinds of money, you know, that's the wrong reason to play music. But if you can work a full-time job and come back and you still, like, you budget your money so that you can still afford your equipment and you budget your time and you take care of yourself so that you still have the energy to be able to apply to your practice. So you keep it going. That shows that you really care about music. Yeah. Or whatever it is that you're passionate. Or whatever it is that you're passionate about. No, yeah, because, in I this mean, case, music. It's weird. Because for me, I just went back to my, my roots, my basics. You know, like, I used to uh, school. This is high school. School, then uh, varsity uh, practice. It was either lacrosse, soccer, or skiing. Then I come home, do my homework because you know i was taking all you know full academic you know, chemistry physics advanced math you know the regular stuff history english uh and then then i'd have rock and roll band practice it might be eight to midnight or whatever it was i did it all so right. on the weekends i either have a gig or we'd practice in the barn we had a barn and um so you know i i'm just going back it's not on not the spoiled musician that's only been on the big stage and that's it. I've been on a private jet. It's the biggest. I played in front of a million people. I did Obama's inauguration. There's a million people in front of me. And I played with 24 out of 20, 25 out of 27 artists I played with. Everybody. Beyonce, Josh Groban, you name it, Bon Jovi, you know, Stevie Wonder, James Taylor. I played with everybody. And um, here I am, right back to practicing, just like I did in the barn. It's not unnormal because I, that's what I love coming back the next day and go Shh, practice. I did yesterday. makes me sound good today. Reminds me of that, um, that quote before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water after enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. Yeah. You know, well, it's like, it's like the, the things that it's like, if you know, if you're going to work towards becoming an enlightened version of yourself, you just do the regular things that you do day in and day out. You chop wood, you carry water, you sweep the yes. floor, you wash the dishes. If you get yes. to that point of self mastery where everything becomes, you become enlightened or you become whatever you're seeking, whatever that is that you're seeking, that, that state of mastery, what happens after that? You keep doing those things. You yes. keep washing the dishes. You keep sweeping the floor. You do it humbly. You do it with discipline. You, you do it, 
You know, you don't be, you don't get humiliated. You don't create excuses. You just show up and you keep doing those things with a humble respect for your wow. life and the direction that you're going in. That's very Buddhist. Uh, boy, rock and roll can take people like, can take the rock star rock and roller. That can take you out of, out of that very easily, especially when you're young. Yeah. Yeah. But you know yeah. what? Eventually you will be reminded it. What did someone say? If you believe what you do is who you are. Let me see if I got this right. If you believe that you are only what you do when you don't do it, then what are you? Yeah, no doubt, man. You know, it's like a boxer. All you know, I'm a, he, that's all he does. He thinks that he is only boxing. And when he retires, who is, who is he? But if you understand you and then do things, then when those things stop, you are still you. So well said. I mean, you must see that on such an exaggerated level in the rock and roll industry. Yeah. I mean, you, I'm sure you have seen so many performers who have identified with their egos, who have identified with their image, who they think they are on stage, and then they just crash and burn at a certain point. Absolutely. They, they, sometimes those people, in some cases, have strived so hard to be that star because they don't want to do the work and deal with the silence of, of whatever they're going through in self-development as a human being. And they're just masking it and masking it. And it just sits there waiting for you. It just sits yeah, okay. there and waits until you're ready to deal with it. That's life. And some people don't get it. They die before it happens. But whatever. You know, I tend to wherever want, you go, there you are. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just, I tend to want to get the most value out of my life. You know, yeah. my mom's 94 and uh, she's, you know, she's got breathing problems, asthma. She's got a heart condition. I said to her the other day, because we're trying to get her out of Sarasota onto a plane to get back home to Stockbridge, Massachusetts in the house I grew up in. She wants to go home and she's high, high, high risk. And, um, and so she, um, I said, God, mom, you know, cause a couple of her friends that she's known just, you know, got taken off to, you know, nursing homes and they won't come out. You know, I said, God, mom, with all your health issues, you're surviving everyone. So oh, damn right. So I want to live. I want to see more. I want to learn more. I want to go to college. I want to go online, take classes. Like there's too much to do. And I want to watch you kids do more. And that's 94. She's fighting. Incredible. Incredible. Well, I can see where some of that comes from, man. Yeah. She's take off, take after your mom. mom. Yeah. She's definitely got, I, if that, I mean, that's why I say to, I'm grateful to be your son, you know? That's don't they call that full of piss and vinegar? That's a, that growing up in Maine. I remember hearing that phrase a lot. Did you grow up in full, Maine? Yeah, I did. Where? Yeah, mid coast area. And uh, I went to right Bar Harbor. I went to. Okay. Yeah. I climbed. Uh, wait, no, that's New Hampshire. I was thinking of a white, the White Mountains. Uh, yeah, New Hampshire. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I grew up maybe halfway between Portland and Bar Harbor, a little town called Waldeboro, on an organic blueberry farm. Oh, love that. I'm a blueberry freak. Um, but uh, yeah, I used to go to Portland all the time. Uh, uh, all the way up to Kenny Bunk Park. Was that in Maine? Yeah, Kenny Bunk Park's in Maine. Yeah, that's, yep. that's uh, down uh, in southern Maine. Portland. Yeah, All up there. Uh, uh, where else in Maine did I go? Name some other cities. Well, there's Bangor, Portland, yep. Bar Harbor, Bay. Yeah. Bay, yep. uh, Camden, Bay too. Rockland. Yeah. We used to go camping. The worst little gnat flies uh, you don't oh, see them, yeah, got, the, the no-see-ems. Yeah, the no-see-ems. Yeah. They, they, like, get in, in your tent. Even if you have your tent closed, they'll still get yeah. inside. They, <laughs> for all the people listening, what they basically are are teeth with wings. <laughs> but you can't see them. No, you can't. <laughs> you know, we used to go camping up there. It was the worst, man. But, God, Maine is so beautiful. How did you end up from Maine to Portland? Although makes sense so, via la so i came out to L I moved out to la in 2001 to uh, after my spinal cord injury happened 
I moved out to LA to study movement with a woman named Emily Conrad, who started a program okay. called Continuum Movement. And I was working on becoming able-bodied again. I thought that I was going to, I, I was on the mission to try to recover function in my body. And I, okay. I didn't get there, but what I did was I actually experienced a whole type of sort of healing inside of myself that I don't think I would have gotten otherwise. And so there was an integration that occurred and, and I, it, then, you know, I stuck around in LA and started making things happen there, you know, eventually met people like you and, and others. And, uh, you know, who knows, maybe I'll be back at some point. I love that part of the world. What made you go up to Portland then? Well, I got a divorce and I just needed a big change of life. Oh yeah. So I decided, you know what, I'm just going to get out of the whole situation for now. Right. I need a change of environment. I, I went through a big life shift. So yeah, I man. decided to move to Portland. Yeah. And Portland is gorgeous up there. And you're going to find town. people that are, that are like-minded like you up there. Yeah. There's great people up here. There really yeah. are. Yeah. I know. There's a, and there's a great music scene up here too. Oh yeah. So, Dude, there used to be a big jazz scene up there. I don't know if it still is, but there used to be a lot of jazz up there. Well, these days there's no scene at all anywhere <laughs> with COVID going on. It's all. <laughs> the, the, uh, scene, the scene has been the four walls of my apartment. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. I'm okay, though, but it'll be interesting to see. You know, I do have that, you know, I this will be the longest I haven't played with other, no, I shouldn't say, I just recorded with a bass player from a government mule on a on a record. So, yeah, but it's, I, it's still performing live in my life for since I was 10. And so you had, you, you put off, you had to put off a tour with my childhood hero, Satch. Dude, have you heard the new record? I have. It's awesome. How do you like it? Starts with me. Is that you? I, yeah, I hadn't even checked the credits. Dude, that, that's a that's an awesome record, man. You know, and he he every song is different. It every is. Song is different. I would say this is my favorite Satch album since Surfing with the Alien. Yeah, that's what they're saying. You know, this entered the charts at number eight, the highest his record. That means he entered Billboard at number eight. He's competing no with all the rap, he's competing with all the rock, he's competing with uh, the Billy Eilish's, all the new people. Came in at eight. That's no kidding. Honor. That's awesome. Wow. And he's always so, sending me songs. He's writing more music now. He's get, he said, that nothing else to do. All. I'm going to write, my goal is to write two albums worth of material before we go on tour. Right, right on. So he's sending you new new material, huh? Yeah, and the band, you know a band called, you got to check them out, called Knower, K-N-O-W-E-R? Knower. Very underground. The, the drummer and leader is Lewis Cole. And okay. look up the song Overture. Overture. Uh, I think it's called Overture. Funky, this cool singer, chick singer. And the keyboard player in the video, if it's the video, they're like in a house. Uh, keyboard player Ray R-A-I, Thistleweight, is in our band for this tour. He, he's an artist himself, sings, plays guitar, but he's heavy bebop, serious bebop player on piano. Really? Like, really? Awesome. Full on. Wow. I mean, he's highly skilled. And he's, oh, that's killer. He's in the band. Great sense of humor. The band is ready to go, just that no place to go. Right, right, right. Well, eventually, and you'll have even more material to work with when it does yeah. happen, huh? Yeah. I love playing with Satch because, oh my God, that the sounds. Where does he come up with that shit? I have no idea. He he he's like you know he's in that same sort of stratosphere as like Jeff Beck, where they have such a unique way of playing the guitar that no one can actually emulate. Like no right. one can sound like Jeff Beck, and no one can sound like Satch. They both have that like. People can copy Hendrix and, you know, there's a difference, but people can sort of copy it. People can copy Stevie Ray Vaughan, that kind of thing. But no one can do that Satch thing. Like that, the way that he uses harmonics and stuff, it's like, and the way that he uses his whammy bar, it's like, what are you doing to that thing? Like, how know, the hell are you creating these sounds? I know. Real. It blows me away. You know, when I, when I uh, played with uh, or auditioned or did our first playing with Chicken Foot, in two seconds, I went, what the fuck? <laughs> that blew me away with his feel. Oh, it was uh, that, that song, uh, maybe it was called Chicken Foot, you know, Bump Butter, no, Big, Big, 
I forget Bigfoot. I don't know. <laughs> it was like boom, 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 eighth notes. But it was the way that the feel he put against my my kick. He sat back, and I'm not used to that. Guitar players usually lean. He sat back and held it in this very, very amazing, killer feeling place. And I just went, whoa. And he went, what? I went, you. That's awesome. Dude, his feel. That is so cool. It was like his feel, it's rhythm. Tony Iommi has that too. They'll sit back and it just makes everything thick. So cool. Yeah, yeah. Now you played on that uh, recent Hendrix Experience tour too. Yeah, we yeah we were in Portland actually at a theater. Uh, I know I I missed that show. I that was, was uh, you know what? we played like go, but... that was incredible. Yeah, we were the headliners and completely different from every. We were like like an atom bomb. Uh, you know, we came out. We played. Um, what did our first song was? Uh, uh, cross. It's cross. Cross town? town traffic. Cross town traffic. Yeah. We had Doug Pinnock playing bass from uh, King's X and singing. And then we went into Manic Depression, which is brilliant. And it was interesting. Joe awesome. said, God, this is the first time he'd been on tour where he was doing covers, you know? Wow. Wow. No doubt. Even Chickenfoot, he wrote those songs with the band. This is like, Doing covered, but you know, you know, a lot of people don't even realize that Satriani was Steve Vai's guitar teacher yeah. in Long Island. Yeah, back in the seventies. Yeah. I mean, this guy, he's been a Satriani has changed. He has trained some of the top guitar players out there. He yeah, is. like one of them was a guy from uh, Metallica, I think, when he was living in San yeah. Fran. He, yeah. He, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, hey, man, I could probably talk to you all day, but I'm sure that you've got some things that you want to get to, man. Yeah. And, and so, I just, I'm, I'm so yeah. glad I did this with you. It's like, um, I'm sorry, at first I was going like, oh, my God. It's like my whole week is covered with podcasts. <laughs> I got, but when it, you know, this, you know, I, I'm so glad I did it with you. Well, I, I really appreciate you, man. And I'm, I'm so glad that you were able to make time to come on. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, this is an awesome discussion. And yeah. maybe we'll do it again sometime. I'd yeah. love to do it again sometime. Yeah. Just, you know, you, I'm part of metal again. So um, <laughs> so I'll be, you'll be seeing me. <laughs> All right, brother. I'll, I'll All right. be able to track you down. All, All right. right. Yeah, take call, care, you man. Can call me anytime you want. Anytime. All right. Thanks, brother. All right. Take, take care, care, man. See ya. Bye.